week at verse 12, or we covered the first uh, uh, 11 verses anyway. And pick up the reading with me at verse 12, Philippians chapter 2. Let's read these verses together. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And here's what we're going to focus on in a few moments. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Meaning that God is the one who is working in your salvation. Do these things, verse 14, without complaining or disputing, so that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights or stars in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may have cause to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. Sir Ender Aurora uh, came to England as a 13-year-old who did not know a word of English. Working hard at making a better life for himself, he joined British Airways as a junior clerk, also worked for a financial institution, worked a number of part-time jobs to pay for his training as a pilot. And uh, his day started at 6.30 in the morning every day and did not end until at least 11 o'clock in the evening. He worked that hard. It was during this time that he started dabbling in estate uh, and, and amassed a significant portfolio in the process. Today, he owns the hotel where he once worked as a waiter. It's one of 15 of his, in his successful business uh, empire, which enjoys a turnover of more than $150 million a year in profits and employs 2,000 people. If you work hard, and you're ambitious, these days that's not there at all. Sometimes you may have to work harder than others, Aurora said. And it is true that anything worth doing will require great effort. To be successful, whether it's in business or in family or in life generally, you have to work hard. While that's true in all other areas of life, it is equally true in matters of faith. That is exactly what the Apostle Paul is telling us in verse 12. Pick up that verse with me again. He tells us in the verse that we just read a moment ago, in fact, this verse is piggybacking off of the previous passage about holding Jesus up as our model. These are instructions to servants. In light of what Jesus has done for us, in light of the model that Jesus is for us, how are we to live? And there are three instructions out of these verses that we just read to servants who are the people of God today. The first is this one. Strive spiritually. Strive spiritually. The word therefore in verse 12 uh, points back to what Paul is basing his appeal on. That is Jesus' servanthood and what he has done. Based upon what Jesus has done for us then, he says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Just as it is true that any great enterprise cannot be done without a lot of hard work, so it is true spiritually. Without working at our faith, you cannot and you will not ever grow spiritually. Tragically, the vast majority of Christians have never really progressed in their faith, and, and that's almost due to a complete lack of effort. In fact, most Christians prefer what I call experiences rather than the hard work of faith on a daily basis. Now, let us not make the mistake, however, that we see this verse as some people do. There is the idea that some folks have of a kind of self-help salvation, that being saved, being made righteous in God's sight, or even having your ticket punched to heaven is something that you are to work for or something that you can work for. People who see salvation in these terms use this verse oftentimes as a statement that salvation can be earned and that it is something that you can work for. However, that is not 
what this verse says at all if you look at it closely. On the contrary, it teaches that because we are already saved, because God has already entered our life in the person of the Holy Spirit, and because we already have His power within us, Paul says in these verses, because of these things, we are to strive to express our salvation in practical terms through our conduct. Now, that should be true for a number of reasons. But first, it is the clear meaning of the sentence itself. Look at this sentence. The verse does not say, work for your salvation. The verse does not say, work uh, towards your salvation. It says, work out your salvation. And no one can work out his salvation unless God has already worked it in. It's by His will and His good pleasure, Paul says, that you have the work of salvation in you already. So what we're being instructed here is simply this. Salvation is a process. It begins the moment that Jesus enters our life and culminates when we enter into heaven. In between, we should grow in our relationship with God we should grow in our understanding of what it means to live the Christian life. We should grow in our knowledge of God's Word. We should grow in our relationship with our fellow believers and in the way in which our faith gets practiced or gets played out in everyday life. That said, there's probably nothing sadder than watching somebody, uh, and oftentimes more tragic, watching somebody who just, just grow. Here I'm speaking about intellectual growth and emotional growth. For example, watching someone who has a keen intellect but never worked at that intellect to develop the intellect they obviously have is not only frustrating, it's painful. Ask any school teacher. They'll tell you that. But not only is that true with intellect, it's also true emotionally. There are a lot of people who have never grown emotionally. In fact, some men never seem to really get out of their adolescence, emotionally speaking. They never grow in terms of emotional growth. You remember the story of Peter Pan? He was the little boy that grew up. Psychologists have actually coined a term for men who have never grown up. It's called the Peter Pan syndrome. Women who marry men with the Peter Pan syndrome are forever frustrated waiting for them to grow up, but they never do. Now, as a has-been athlete and a very, very short tenured coach, I always found it extremely frustrating to watch guys who had been given some natural athletic gifts and had exceptional athletic skills, skills but never work to turn those skills into something breathtaking. It is really was really painful to watch. And I have a personal story about that. And it involves my oldest and closest friend in life, John. We met in the first grade. We have been friends all through the ten years of that age. Long time. We played, we hunted and fished together. I, I, collectively, it would be weeks and months and years over a long period of time, and we played a lot of ball together. But it was always frustrating for me to watch this guy who was one of the most naturally gifted athletes I have ever been around, and that saying a lot, never work at his natural gift. I'll give you two, two examples of how this is true. As a sophomore in a high school that had the highest classification in the state of Arkansas, he was our starting quarterback, our starting defensive end, handled all the kicking duties, hunted, uh, you know, after point kicks, everything. But after our junior year, he didn't quit because he didn't want to work at it. Had all the students. In fact, when he went to Colorado State University as a freshman, uh, their kicker broke his leg in the third game of the season. Somebody found out he had hunted. So they asked him to come on. He hunted the next six games. Quit anyone work at football in basketball as a sophomore. He started as a sophomore on a team that was in fourth in the state. As a senior, he set the in almost the whole season because he would never work at his athletic gifts. And it was painful to 
watch this, especially for those who are less gifted than he was, and I will only see that. But far worse than emotional, intellectual, or even athletic growth is the lack of spiritual growth that exists among the majority of Christians. In fact, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 95%, if not more, of people who claim to know Jesus seriously and personally have never really grown beyond the day they came to know Christ. That is true primarily because they've never really made any real effort at growing in their faith. Few Christians, for example, read the Bible daily. Few Christians pray regularly. Few Christians actually exercise their faith in a daily way and find ways in which God can use them. They put in their one or two hours a week at church, and that is their extent at growing in their relationship with God. You can call it like that. Like everything else, anything worth doing in life, folks, will require hard work. So apparently for many Christians, the vast majority of Christians, faith is not worth notice here that we are to work out our salvation fear and This bit about fear and fear is not to us in a posture of dissenting. It is rather referred to verses 9, 10, and 11. Go back and look at verses 9, 10, 11. What does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus is Lord, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. In the light of the fact that He is Lord, in light of the fact of what Jesus has done, we should have the proper awe in the presence of God to work out our salvation. That means that we should not approach the gift of salvation casually or lightly, but as people who are in awe of the living God. It means quite simply that we should not treat our faith as a toy or a hobby. But I can preach this sermon a hundred times to a thousand people each time, and other pre pre preachers can do the same thing, and still no more than five people collectively in all those times will ever take their faith seriously and work it out because their faith, if you can call it that, is a hobby. It's not a calling. It's not a way of life. It's certainly something not to be taken seriously. And because of that, folks, because we lack grow, an effort on the part of growing as Christians, no wonder then we have largely lost the culture war. Our infantile faith as individual believers have left us on the sidelines and while we're standing on the sidelines because of an infantile faith in the meanwhile the enemy has made great and significant progress at our expense well the next verse or I think it's verse uh, 14 tells us the second instruction here in this verse it tells us in verse 14 do things without cleaning and disputing. Now, the word actually means complaining. It actually means murmuring. And it sounds as bad as it means. It describes a sound that, that, that goes something like this. You know, people mumbling under their breath. Take a take case of a child. You say to the child, now go upstairs and get your pajamas on and then come down and we'll kiss you goodnight, it's time to go to bed. And the child just stands there silently looking at you. He's disputing in his heart, you don't know this, how much he can get away with. He's, he's going through a process of internal dialogue within himself. So you say, now go on, go on, it's time to go to bed. And he knows he has to do it. But as he turns to walk out the door, you hear him say, I don't want to go to bed. What? What was it you said? And he, the child says, I don't want to go to bed. What? What was that? He says, nothing. And then off he goes. And that's what we do with God. Don't we? 
We have this dialogue inside ourselves when we know that God wants us to do something or the issue of obedience crops up in our life and we know we need to obey God, but we have this murmuring in ourselves, in our heart that goes on, where we're pretty much saying, God, I don't want to do that. I mean, that goes on. We have this internal dialogue. By the way, murmuring in the Bible, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is also why this murmuring and this complaining gets verbalized outwardly because it's an attitude. And because it's an attitude, we begin to process it. It's why we, as a country, we don't know this, have become a nation of whiners. We also live in the culture of complaint today. This is also true in the church as it is anywhere else, and that should certainly not be. But the attitude is a negative attitude, and this does not glorify God, and yet the church sometimes seems to be filled with complaining and murmuring people. Now, we don't have that here, but we could almost overnight. But this idea of having a negative attitude reminds me of my favorite story, and I know some of y'all have heard this before, but because I'm an avid duck hunter, I'm going to share it with you again. There were two farmers. One was a very optimistic farmer, one was a very negative farmer. They'd drive down the fence row in their tractors, and the sun would be shining. The optimistic farmer would say to his negative neighbor, My, isn't God good giving our crops the sun so they can grow in his negative Farmer uh, counterpart says, yeah, but if it doesn't rain real soon, it's all going to burn up. Then it rains. He looks over the fence at his neighbor and he says, isn't God good giving our crops a rain and a drink of water? And his, and his neighbor says, yeah, but it doesn't quit so, so pretty soon. It's all going to wash away. Nothing could shake this guy. So finally, the optimistic farmer goes out and he buys the best duck hunting dog, a retriever that money can buy and money can train. And then he invites his negative counterpart to go duck hunting. And so there they are. And the first flock of ducks come in and they're just cupping their wings over the decoys and they fire. Boom, 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 boom. And the dog, the retriever, doesn't jump into the water. He walks across the water picks up the first duck, walks back across the water, picks up the second duck, walks back across the water, gets the third duck, walks back across the water. And the optimistic farmer looks at his friend and says, what do you think about that? The Navy counterpart says, can't swim, can he? You see, there are some people, no matter what, they'll find a reason to complain. They're just not satisfied. And that's because they have a negative attitude. Well, there are enough whiners and complainers around, and this passage tells us that should not be true of the people of God. We are to be blameless, this passage says. That word is used here. That means we should do nothing that should reflect God in a negative light to other people in our world. That's what blameless means. We should not be a poor reflection upon God. And grumbling and complaining and a negative attitude and fault-finding people are a poor reflection upon a gracious and merciful God. We are to be pure, which doesn't mean that we are to be perfect, but rather that our conduct should exemplify the Christ that we claim to know. We should be very, very careful about what comes out of our mouths because usually it's already on our hearts. It's already an attitude that is firmed up. And we need to be very careful when we start playing. Third instruction. We find it in verse 16. Hold fast to the word of life. Now the word of life is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, but it also includes the word of God. The, the gospel itself is life abundant in this world as we live knowing Jesus and when we enter heaven for all eternity. 
Paul says quite correctly in these verses, if you'll notice, that we live among a crooked and depraved generation. Well, that was true in Paul's day. But that is probably more true in our own time. We live in a crooked and depraved generation. It seems like the world in which we live is increasing in its darkness and its decay. And this darkness and decay seems to be accelerating and creeping in with each passing day. And we are encouraged in the same verse as elsewhere in the New Testament to be stars, to be the light of the world. We are to shine in such darkness. We do that by holding fast to the Word of Light and to the Word of God. This doesn't mean for us to take, again, a defensive stance, but rather to go on the offense. It means to be as much light as we can be in our world and in our culture. We are to go on the offense by holding up the Word of Light, by holding up the Word of God. This is why it is such critical importance for us to grow spiritually. And it is why we find ourselves as Christians playing defense so often without the necessary spiritual growth, without the effort for us to grow spiritually, we will never be able to shine a star. We'll never be able to hold up the word of life. And we will never be able to hold up God's word to people in a life-giving way that it will affect them in a positive way where they will know Jesus. We must go on offense by living the word of life ourselves, by holding it up, but we're going to have to do more by than living it. We must also talk about it. We're going to have to articulate our faith. And if you're not growing spiritually, you can't articulate your faith. And if we don't do that, we're not on Dale and Pearl Rats had just arrived at a church music program on a cold February evening in Iron Mountain, Michigan. As they were taking off their coats, Pearl fell over crying, My head! My head! It feels like it's exploding! Then she passed out, went into convulsions, and into a deep coma. They'll describe what happens next, what happened next, as they prayed over her while they were waiting for the ambulance, and he said, I heard the words of Psalm 118, which says, You shall live and not die, and declare the works of the Lord. I began to speak those words over my unconscious wife. I had an inner sense that I would see them come true. Pearl would not die. She would live by the authority of the Word of God. Well, a friend went with Dale to the hospital, and uh, they went into a nearby room while the doctors were obviously working on Pearl. And while he was there, he began to think, and then he did the only thing he needed to do. Obviously, this was the worst storm, the worst crisis of his life, and he lifted up his hands and began praising God, thanking him for his word. Dale's sense of shock and numbness gave way, and he uh, prayed, and he claimed a number of Bible verses over his ailing wife. The doctors came out, and they said this, your wife has had a massive stroke and most likely will be dead within hours. If she does live, she will never again regain consciousness and she will always be paralyzed from the neck down. Dale hung on the Word of God. He resolved to stay in a faith position and not give in to fear. The next day, the doctors told him, our tests show that Pearl has suffered a catastrophic stroke and large parts of her brain are totally destroyed. She will never come out of her coma, and even if she does, she will never recognize you or remember you. I'm sorry to have to tell you this. There is no hope. Dale's response was, maybe from a human perspective, there is no hope. But where there is God, there is hope. Just as Abraham considered not his own body, I resolve not to consider Pearl's nearly lifeless body, but to meditate instead on the promises of God and to continually speak them over my wife. And that's what Dale did. He knew that getting Pearl back from her seemingly 
hopeless state would be a long fight. But he also knew that God was up to the task. Dale stayed in the hospital day and night with Pearl for weeks and weeks and weeks watching her and praying over her and holding up the word of life over her, her behalf. But that's not all he did. During this same period of time, he found himself ministering in other parts of the hospital. He would go into other rooms and he would pray for people who's also, whose cases were also so-called hopeless. And he saw creative miracles that saved lives and brought the reality of God to those patients and those families. And in fact, he was actually in another patient's room praying for that person's healing when Pearl finally opened her eyes, saw the family in her room, recognized them, and began speaking. Dale knew how to apply the word of life, not just for himself and his wife, but also for others in that hospital. And God used that. He believed in the promises of God. He believed in the, in, in the word of life and held up those promises and held up that word to others. The word worked for Pearl. She mended quickly, today, completely well. She is vibrant and alive some 15 years later. And that is a case that has been documented by all the medical personnel involved and others who are involved as well. Holding out the word of life what God wants us to do. I've seen dozens of these situations for myself and know of countless others. God's word, the power of Jesus, is undeniable. And we should hold out that word, we should hold out that gospel in such a way that not only do we know it's true, but that others know that we know that it's true. Hold firm to the word of life. Live it. Watch what God will do. Let's pray to God. Father, I thank you that in these verses we have some clear instructions how we are to live as your people. There are things that we should do. There are some things that we should not do. But the most important thing that we should do is to grow spiritually in such a way that it affects our attitudes and it affects the way and we begin to live out our faith in real life. That we have a faith that we can be lit, that can be lived in real life, that can be a difference and make a difference not just in our lives, but the lives of people around us. Because our task in the world, Father, is to hold up this word of life that we know to be true so that others might know the same life-giving force that is in Jesus that we know. We can't do this, Lord, on our own. We certainly can't do it without working out our salvation by giving this gift the effort that deserves and grows spiritually. And my prayer this morning is that for all of us, you will convict us that we need to start growing in Jesus name Amen